It began in 1995 and I was 29. So we decided to move to LA and we had everything going for us. I had my SAG card, I had my master's degree. We found a wonderful house, we had day jobs. I got an agent right away, like everything went bing, bang, boom. And I thought life was fantastic and I was gonna be a star, right? That's what I thought. Like I said, everything was going great, but I had all this weird anxiety and I was having all these weird physical symptoms. And I had this attack of sleep paralysis in my bed. Uh, in which I heard an electronic voice say my name, which was very disturbing. I had had sleep paralysis before, but I had never had a, a voice or an image. Like it was very disturbing, right? It happened again a few hours later. And it was so disturbing to me in, in conjunction with the sighting and also the weird bodily symptoms I had been having for a few months. I had pregnancy symptoms, to be honest. I made an appointment with Barbara Lamb, who is a regression therapist. And I had this full on alien abduction memory that was extremely traumatizing. What I recalled was being taken through my ceiling in a blue column of light. That was a very turquoisey blue. It seemed very solid. And I went up, up, up in this light in a fetal position. And then the next thing I knew, I was flat on a table in a misty room with beings staring at me, screaming, you know, just like in utter terror. And I couldn't move my body. like to welcome to the Bigfoot Crossroads podcast, Camille James Harmon. How are you, Camille? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's a beautiful day here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. This is so far out of my wheelhouse. I I'm usually pretty comfortable, but I I'm actually kind of nervous talking about this stuff. A and you came highly recommended as someone that I should have on my show to kind of get me used to the waters, get my feet wet. Wow. I'm really honored, and there's so much crossover, actually. I think you will become comfortable. First off, let's just talk about how your actual UFO journey kind of began. So um, it began in, for me, it began in 1995, and I was 29. I was an actress. I am an actress still, but I was an actress fresh out of grad school and coming off of playing Lady Anne in a production of Richard III in New Orleans, which was outstanding. It was outdoor theater. We had a horse on stage. My boyfriend was Richard. I was Lady Anne. We felt like we were just hot stuff, right? So we decided to move to L.A., and we had everything going for us. I had my SAG card. I had my master's degree. Uh, we had a we got to L.A. We stayed with friends. We found a wonderful house. We had day jobs. I got an agent right away. Like everything went bing, bang, boom. And I thought life was fantastic and I was going to be a star. Right. That's what I thought. So, however, <laughs> <laughs> right before right before moving, I would say August of that year, while I was still in New Orleans selling art in an art gallery in the French Quarter, I took a lunch break and went over to the bookstore and got this Whitley Streeper book that just jumped out at me. It was his book, Breakthrough. And it wasn't the first alien book he had written, um, but I was a little familiar with him from the movie Communion because I love Christopher Walken. And I said, oh my gosh, that guy's still writing about aliens. I wonder what he has to say now. So I got the book and I was reading the book and it blew my mind. So that was kind of my trigger, catalyst, whatever you want to call it, into uh, knowing anything about the phenomena. I really didn't know anything about it really, you know, until then. Um, so I, I moved to new Orleans in September, the very next month. And like I said, everything was going great, but I had all this weird anxiety and I was having all these weird physical symptoms. And, um, my boyfriend and I had driven from New Orleans to L.A. with the U-Haul and our stuff and our, you know, the car towing behind and the dog and the whole thing. And we went, uh, we kind of took the pretty way and we actually camped in Sedona. Um, and I don't know, like maybe because we, we were on this creek actually where there were Bigfoot sightings on Oak Creek. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, 
I didn't know that at the time. I, I read about that later uh, when I was reading about Bigfoot. But I don't know if anything weird happened, to be honest, on that journey from New Orleans to L.A. But in December in L.A., um, we had a sighting. My boyfriend and I, our first sighting, daylight sighting, only because the dog was barking at a tree because uh, the squirrel had run up it and there was a nest of squirrels at the top of this palm tree and we were laughing. And then we noticed this black thing up in the sky, really, really high, that wasn't moving. And uh, we were on a hill where we had a view of the whole sky and it had this kind of shimmer around it. It was really hard to make out the shape of it. But we looked at each other briefly and he was kind of teasing me like, you and your UFO book. Mm, now we're seeing a UFO. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, shut up. You know, and then we looked back up and it was gone. And that's when I, I was like, you know, whoa, hold the leash. I'm running home. I'm going to report it. So I literally handed him the dog leash and ran home and looked up in the phone book back then. And they had a UFO hotline for MUFON. So I called it and I reported it. And they said, oh, we have these UFO meetings. Do you want to come? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm there. And meanwhile, this is December again, 95. Um, I had this weird episode at night where I was sleeping with him. Well, actually... I was sleeping with him. But that night he was watching um, a David Lynch movie in the living room. I remember it well. And I didn't want to watch it. And so I was asleep alone. And I had this attack of sleep paralysis in my bed uh, in which I heard an electronic voice say my name, which was very disturbing. And I saw an image of a gun pointed at my face, just a flash of an image. And it was so weird because I had had sleep paralysis before, but I had never had a a voice or an image like it was very disturbing right and sure um then he came in and he went to sleep with me and then it happened again without that just the just the sleep paralysis it happened again a few hours later and it was so disturbing to me it, in conjunction with the sighting and also the weird bodily symptom, symptoms i had been having for a few months like i had no menstrual cycle i had um sore breasts. I had pregnancy symptoms, to be honest, but I had never been pregnant before that I knew of, so I wasn't really clued in to what that was, but um, long story short, I, I went to a MUFON meeting with Kim Carlsberg, who's an abductee who had a book out, and at the end of her presentation, I was so disturbed by her story, um, I just knew I was one of these people. Like you, I can't describe it. I just had a knowing, and my whole body was shaking, and I I went over and read the back of her book. She had a checklist in the back. Like, you might have been abducted if, and it had all these things. And I was going through it just, you know, uh, yeah, that, yep, 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 yep. Oh, wow, yep, that too. So I had all these, like, 85% of the symptoms on that list. And I made an appointment with Barbara Lamb, who is a regression therapist. And she uh, she and I finally did my regression in, I think it was April of 1996, you know, targeting this event in um, December. And I had this full-on alien abduction memory that was extremely traumatizing. You know, like, I have the recording. It's full-blown screaming, teeth-chattering terror. And what I recalled was being taken through my ceiling in a blue column of light that was a very turquoisey blue it seemed very solid, unlike a spotlight. If you, like if you went to a concert and saw a spotlight, it wasn't like that. And I went up, up, up in this light in a fetal position. And then the next thing I knew, I was flat on a table in a misty room with beings staring at me, screaming, you know, just like in utter terror. And I couldn't move my body. So um, basically what they were telepathically telling me to calm down. Everything would be okay. And then my knees magically opened and I really lost it. And another being that I could not see, I was blocked from remembering what that being looked like, um, came toward me with this speculum, like gynecological tool and, uh, quickly inserted that and took out some kind of a little fetus of some kind, like, small, like really small that I could barely see through this instrument and, and walked out of the room and I was crying and, and just very bereft and, and 
you know, moaning and crying that they didn't let me see it and just feeling this horror. And, and, you know, I mean, how would you imagine feeling? It's just the most bizarre thing. I'm just sitting here in kind of a state of shock. Just, I can't imagine how horrifying that would be. Well, and people sometimes get mad at me. Like I'm sitting here telling you the story and I'm not crying and they think, well, if that's true, she should be crying, just telling the story. And, you know, I've told it a million times and I'm, I'm kind of like not jaded by it, but just there's so much else to the story. I just, I tell it that way because I'm trying to get to the other things without crying. But I, you know, I have moments when, you know, I have built up a wall about that, to be honest. It's just too much for me to handle. I would just imagine that that sort of trauma is something that's dealt with over a period of time. And there's different resources in a person's life to help them deal with going through such an event. And all of this was just kind of dumped on you instantly. Exactly. Exactly. And so I go home with this little cassette tape that Barbara gives me. And, you know, she says, well, this is very common. Like this happens all the time with women and men have their sperm taken and, you know, they're shown their babies on the spaceship and all this stuff. And I'm like, holy crap, you know, um, okay, uh, I don't know what to do with this. So I, I go home, I play the tape for my poor boyfriend and he's like, oh, great. You know, this is like the most terrifying thing I've ever heard. And it's my girlfriend and I don't know if this is real. And, you know, he tried to be supportive and. But he was just not into it at all. Like, I tried to make him do things with me that were UFO related. I got obsessed, as you might imagine. I was going to, sure. you know, support group meetings and MUFON meetings. And um, it happened again in another way when he was out of town. And, you know, okay, so I'm just trying to kind of blast through my story here because I want to get to the bigger picture and all the conclusions I've been making about it. But, Okay, so the next thing that happened in 1996, he was out of town shooting back in New Orleans of all things. So I was alone, sleeping alone for a week, and uh, I woke up three mornings in a row with my digital alarm clock saying 400, exactly. And I hadn't heard a noise or anything. I was just waking up and staring at my clock at 400, three nights in a row. I was like, what the heck? Like, what is going on? And the third morning, my friend had invited me to the beach, so I was sh- going to shave, and I noticed I had this bleeding triangular puncture wound on my left calf that was fresh, like a little freshly scabbed red pinprick array in the shape of a triangle. And I thought, oh, my God, I know this is some alien thing. I've seen it in a book or a show, or I started flipping through all my shows. I was recording on the VHS, and you know, I had books, and... Sure enough, I found it on somebody's arm or something. And since then, I've met, I've met about four people who've had that same triangle wow. on different parts of their body. Um, so I did a regression to that with Yvonne Smith, who's another regressionist in the area in Los Angeles. And um, I got aliens again, only this time I went in the blue beam out the window instead of straight up, which was kind of interesting. And I had... Okay, I didn't describe my beings last time. The beings that I did see in the first one were um, what you would call a gray, okay? But they had white robes on, and they had the big black eyes. They had um, long arms. They had the white robes, and they had some kind of an emblem on their chest. And I think it was like a triangle inside a circle. Um, I remember triangle and circle. I don't remember the, the exact vision of it so this time i had three little wrinkly guys i only saw the tops of their heads and there's one at my feet two on either side of my head and i was cussing at them and then there was a tall one like the doctor that ha- that was the tall gray but he was white in color all my grays that i've seen are white um and he had the white robes and he had um this high collar on the robe and at one point he grew antenna, which was really weird. So I don't know. I don't know with these things and hypnosis and all that. I don't know what's real and what is them tricking us or a hologram or, you know, I don't know what's real of any of this, but I just, ha- I have these weird things on my body and then they match these memories and the memories are so emotional that I, I think it's real, but you know, I don't know. So 
this being put this uh, triangle in my leg using an instrument that he took down from the ceiling, kind of like a dentist would have stuff, you know, above you that they would grab and, and like the light, you know, like it was like that, like just thinking out of the ceiling. So, okay, that was the second one. And um, same thing, lots of crying. Uh, but at one point, one of the little guys, when I was cussing at it, I was cussing at it and saying, you look like a little kid, but you're not a little kid. You make me scared of little kids because you look like little kids, but you're not a little kid. And at the time, I was a substitute teacher. And I had this experience where these third graders were pulling me over to a cabinet. And I, my whole body went into the cellular memory of being, um, like, you know, grabbed and led by little beings. And I, I mean, I made it through the day. I didn't, like, freak out in class. But, you know, my whole body went like, oh, deja vu. What the heck is happening? And so... Um, but when the little being put its hand on my forehead, when I was screaming at it, I, I said, get your freaking hand off me, you little bastard, or something. And, um, but all my anger melted away, which was interesting to me. So they had some kind of superpower of um, calming a person. Like a mental sedative. Yeah, by touching the forehead, which was interesting. And I met someone else later who had that experience. Um. So what's great about all these groups is you, you know, you tell stories and you, you validate each other through very specific things and it's, it's good, you know? Yeah. Um, so another time I had my dentist find this weird thing in my tooth and it was, he had worked on the tooth previously a few months before, but it wasn't there. And now it was, I had a, a feeling that was hurting that he had just done. So he found this, this dark charcoal gray mass uh, like a sphere in my tooth. And he wrote a whole letter about it for me for a TV show I did. And he didn't know what it was. So um, he was able to drill part of it down, but it was really hard. He couldn't get me a chunk. He had to kind of powderize it and it was going down the drain, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I did a regression to that with Barbara and I had a, what's called a military abduction memory, which is another thing. So that's a real um, disturbing aspect of this phenomena when people have humans seemingly abducting them and doing medical stuff to them and such um, interrogating them um, there is some speculation about that phenomenon that our humans on planet earth here or some of them are in cahoots with the aliens uh, that there are various factions of aliens and military or paramilitary corporate whatever you want to call them you know dudes in uniforms that um, abduct the abductees in order to uh, question them, um, tag them, test them for certain skills or knowledge that they may have because of their alien encounters. That seems to be what they're interested in is grooming certain people with certain skills for operations with them. In my case, I didn't have that much information. All they did was I, I came to in my memory. There was no beam of light or anything. I just came to on a medical table in a real room, like not a fuzzy white room, but a, an actual exam room. And I felt really drugged. I didn't have that paralyzed, hyper alert feeling. I had a, a like a drugged feeling. And these two guys in there with white lab coats and khaki pants um, called me a troublemaker and then proceeded to insert a syringe into my jaw from the outside through my cheek, um, which was whatever this was in my tooth. So it wasn't through the mouth like a dentist, but it was like externally a syringe put into my cheek. And then I was rolled down a hall, put in a helicopter and the ceiling opened. And I remember how bright it was. It was daytime. And they flew me home to LA to my neighborhood in Silver Lake landed in this field that is still a field. I just went over there recently. It's still an undeveloped field right by my old house and told me to get out and walk home and take a nap. So I don't have any memory after that. So I don't know how they picked me up and I don't know how I got home from the helicopter, but that scared the hell out of me. And I was so angry when I came out of that hypnosis because it was, it was such a different feeling of, of terror. Like, Oh my God. Like it, you know, but the betrayal of your own kind and the, the implications of being in a secret government, something that has that kind of ability to 
interfere with you and make you forget was just like really scary. Scarier than the aliens, to be honest. Yeah, I actually talked to a witness on this podcast about sort of a repressed memory that they had where they were taken by some sort of human military personnel on a train somewhere. And that's all they remember. Mm -hmm. They just remember being taken in, on this train. It's terrifying. Cause then you, then you start thinking like if that happened and that's real, then what the hell else has happened to me that I don't yeah. remember? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, aliens, extraterrestrials have this ability, but humans have the ability to do that. That gets scary in a hurry. I know. Yeah, exactly. So that happened. And then the only really outstanding good experiences I had, because there are good ones. I don't want to make it all bad. Um, I, w I found myself talking about humans like like I wasn't a human. I like saying things like, oh, humans this, and humans that, you know. And I, I thought, why am I talking like that? Why am I, you know, associating myself subconsciously with being not human? That's how I felt. I felt like there's some longing that's the way I put it to Barbara I went in for hypnosis and I said Barbara I have this longing for some group of beings but I don't know who they are and can we target that is that too abstract and she said no let's go let's go for it so I had this whole out of body experience in that hypnosis that was really amazing and wonderful and I went to this state of being a blue light like that was my form. I was this blue light and I recognized my friends who were blue lights and we were in the, I don't know if you want to say in outer space or the void, like we were just in darkness and then the earth appeared and I didn't want to go to earth and I was panicking and I said, I don't want to go to earth. Why do I have to go to earth? And Barbara said, is there someone you can ask? Why do you have to go to earth? And so these light beings appeared that were, bigger than us and I mean I could kind of make out arms and legs amongst the light but no faces but they were pure love and it, when I saw them I just I was overcome with love and knowledge and emotion and homecoming and just crying you know it was it was the most memorable ecstatic thing ever and I was I was saying things like they're my home they're my family that's why I wear a white bathrobe you know like I used to have robes they, I, I had like this image of them with the white robes again but separate from they didn't seem to be the ones that had me on the table with the big heads and the black eyes so I asked why do I have to go to earth and they said the earth needs you and I said why and they said to fight evil and I was like oh god really like how am I supposed to do that <laughs> and, and they said through your acting and I said okay and they, well they also said tell people we exist and that we love them and I said okay am I supposed to like lecture about you and they said no you're going to do it through your acting and I said okay like great How's that going to happen? Most stuff that gets made is crap. And they said, don't worry, we will set it up for you and so that you meet people and make projects that are worthy of your time. And I said, oh, please, thank you. That would be amazing. <laughs> and it was weird because the very next little film I did, even though it was just a short at USC, it was a movie called The Encounter. And it was about a man who has an angelic encounter. So that was kind of cool. Wow. Um, and I have done films and things since then that I feel are moving the needle toward fighting evil. You know, I've done other stuff that's not, you know, obviously, but I've done some things that I'm very proud of in that regard. And um, they gave they gave me this image like we're always here sending you love and you guys are just walking around with umbrellas. And I had this image of this light source like God shining through them. And then they through their arms came out these rays of light that were going toward the earth but everybody was walking around with an umbrella and it was really a nice image um i don't know what they were i don't know if they were angels or some kind of other form of extraterrestrial or I, I, that's where this whole phenomenon you'll find out as you get more into it it gets very confusing with the whole you know classification system of beings and 
And no, I think they're interdimensional. I think um, I think Bigfoot is interdimensional too, by the way. And uh, there are a lot of accounts that that lean towards Bigfoot being some kind of a an interdimensional being, and that's why it's so hard to get evidence because they just come in and out of this reality. So, um, my feelings have changed over the years. You know, at one point in 2013, I I went. I had a born again Jesus experience about it all. And I just dropped out. I just thought it was all demonic. And I went back to church like really intensely. I got confirmed. I was in the Latin mass with the veil and the Gregorian chant. And I loved it. I was in heaven and it was hard on my marriage. You know, my husband's an astrologer and he was like, wow, you know, like, great. Your religion doesn't like what I do for (laughs) a living. And how is this going to work out? So since then I have, I have, come out of being super, you know, into religion. Um, Last year, I would say I started backtracking on this idea that they're all demonic. And I opened up my, you know, brain to the concepts of, well, maybe they're angelic and demonic, or maybe there are angels, demons, and aliens, and maybe there are time travelers, and maybe there are interdimensionals that live, live alongside us because, a lot of these creatures and the UFOs and stuff are associated with craft that go underwater, craft that go into mountains, into volcanoes. So I just, you know, I, I started looking at things that made me kind of backtrack on that. I didn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I still have a very strong, I still have a very strong feeling about Jesus. And I do think Jesus is like the king of the universe and has authority over the aliens. And I actually had Jesus save me from an ab- abduction years before. That was very weird. So that predated the one in LA. It was a dream that I think maybe was an abduction attempt. Um, so I just have this big soup of ideas in my head. I haven't really attached myself. I wrote for UFO magazine for five years. From 2000 to 2004, that was fascinating. I got to meet all the big names in the field. I went to England to see the crop circles in 1998. That was amazing. Uh, I've had a lot of wonderful adventures and synchronicities. Um, I've made amazing friends in this field, but I really haven't made up my mind about anything. I'm just very open-minded. I love hearing people's stories and just filing it away in my brain you know, and seeing how this plays out over time. I do think, though, there's something eminent happening with disclosure because I think whether the government discloses or the aliens disclose and the government just scrambles to keep up, it's all happening. Like the Nazca mummies, you guys should look into that. There's these Peruvian mummies that have been analyzed by doctors using CAT scans and, you know, x-rays and all these techniques, and they, they seem to be a thousand years old and legitimately anomalous beings with big heads and three fingers and three toes and all kinds of weird things in their body. And that is blowing up the news in Peru. It hasn't hit the news hard in the United States, but if you go on Twitter and look up Nazca mummies, that's a good place to start. That was something I wanted to ask you about most of the information. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with just being in the United States, but a lot of the stuff, whenever it comes to, especially with, abductees and experiencers seems to be centered around the United States a lot. And you don't really hear about this stuff happening in say India, for instance, is it happening in other places? Is it just the it lack is. of communication with the media? No, it's, it's lack of communication with the media. It happens all over the world. We have some amazing cases from Brazil, from France, from England, from Africa. Oh yeah. It's, it's worldwide. Um, and there's so many documentaries that have been made. Like there's a great movie by James Fox called moment of contact. I think that's the right name. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's called the, it's called the, the, um, the Roswell of Brazil. That's the subtitle moment of contact, the Roswell of Brazil. And it's amazing. It's about this incident in Brazil in 1994 or I think maybe 96 um, where a UFO crashed and there were beings running around town that the police picked up one of them. The firemen picked up another of them 
And uh, another one was witnessed by these three girls, and they had this horrible smell. One of the girls thinks it was a demon because they had red eyes and black oily skin. And uh, But the film interviews people that were involved with that, like interviews the sister of the policeman who died because he touched the creature and he died a couple of weeks later in the hospital. He got a horrible disease of some kind. They interviewed a guy who x-rayed one of the aliens in a body bag for the military. And then the military ended up handing over the bodies to the Air Force that came down and picked them up. So our country does seem to have deals with places to pick up the crashes and the bodies and take them back here. And there you know, are news blackouts on that, or there were news blackouts on that. So this has been going, along, going on all over the world. But the reason I say I think it's imminent, not only because of the kind of stuff we're seeing in the news with Congress and all, but because maybe it's just because I'm 57, right? But there are a lot of people my age um, that have had this experience. And we are now at an age of what you would call authority in society just because of our age, you know. And it seems like if the aliens knew some kind of timeline was going on, that they were working on people my age, you know, from childhood. And I probably had childhood experiences too. I have a lot of red flags for possible childhood abduction. Uh, it seems like they, you know, they were like grooming us to be useful in some kind of disclosure in the very near future because of our age and our knowledge about this stuff. And if they, if, if this was going to happen later, they would have started on the next generation. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they would have just forgotten about my generation, started on my son or whoever, you know, whatever the timeline would work out to be. So to me, I'm, it feels really eminent. Do you think specific people are targeted? I do. And we've all been trying to figure that out. You know, you go through that stage when you, when this happens to you, you're like, why me? Why? You know, is it, is it, um, I mean, I went through everything you could think of. Is it my DNA? Is it my genetics? Is it my blood type? Is it my family? I have an uncle who worked for NASA and a cousin who works for NASA. Is it my, um, you know, is it a, a contract I made with the beings in another spiritual dimension? You know, is it um, is it for my sins? Am I being punished? Is it demonic? You know, like you think of everything. You're like, why? Uh, but then when you look at the fact that it happens to children, that kind of, you know, makes you think, well, it's not about sin unless it's generational sin. It does seem to run in families, though. And on my mother's side, my grandmother saw aliens in the hospital one of the times she was in the hospital before she died, you know, like when she was old in and out of the hospital a lot. Yeah. And my family got mad at me. They said, you filled her head with aliens. And now she's hallucinating aliens in the hospital. And I said, maybe she really saw them. And yeah, maybe she was on drugs, but you know, maybe she could see beyond the veil because she was on drugs. I don't know. Don't get mad at me. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but those are the kinds of things we all think about. I know in a lot of situations, and obviously you're included in this group, an experiencer, it, it's not just an isolated event. It, it happens over and over numerous times. Right. Well, it happened to me in this cluster during 1995 and 96. And then, but I went to all these different healers because I was like, this has got to stop. And there were people that said they could make it stop. I went to a woman who actually had an ad in the whole lifetimes back then. And her name was Marie Angelique Raphael, and she's still around. She's on Facebook. And she said she could stop alien abduction. So I went in, and I paid her, and she did some prayers on me. And she said I signed a contract to work with these beings, and I could sever the contract. And I said, okay, do your thing. Let's do it. And she prayed with me, and she she specifically prayed to St. Michael the Archangel and St. Germain and asked them to cut her, to sever the contract I had made on any time, space, or dimension. So that was interesting and cathartic. And um, I also went to a Peruvian shaman who was in town visiting, and he did a like a, 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 a shamanic clearing on me. And um, he told me I had witchcraft put on me, which was very interesting. Um, so it stopped happening. You know, it stopped happening, and uh, I, I have seen UFOs. I've photographed UFOs, and recently, a year or so ago, 
I was at church and I was scheduled to speak at UFO con and, um, I was nervous about it. I was like, Oh God, you know, if I go back into UFOs publicly, is Jesus going to be mad at me or is this okay? You know, I was like right. really confused about like, is this all right? Am I stupid? Or am I, you know, I want to be useful, but I don't want to lead people astray. And so I'm, I'm trying to like be useful with my story, but not, you know, I'm just very conflicted. So anyway, I made this prayer at church and I looked up in the sky at church and I said, Jesus, this is what I specifically said. I said, Jesus, okay, I'm about to go do this thing and, you know, UFO con. And are you, I said, Jesus, are you working with any good beings in the UFOs? Because if so, I really need a sign. And I looked up and these four things flew out of the clouds and started flying around over my head at church. I have, to, I, I go to church outside, by the way, we were in a tent from COVID, this big tent. And, um, we just kept the tent up cause we got so big. We couldn't fit back in our little building. So where I was sitting, I had a view of the sky, this little triangle of, of sky that I could see. And that's, and I whipped my camera out and I got it all on camera and it's on my YouTube channel. If anybody wants to go look at it. And so these four white objects come out of the clouds, clouds really high and start flying around and I videotaped them for a few seconds and then I got really self-conscious because there were people behind me and um and I don't know what those were but it seemed like a sign it seemed like it was okay you know yeah and I showed it to Chris Bledsoe about a month later and he said Camille those were angels and I said oh I hope so <laughs> that would be awesome and so he's been a a a friend over the last year someone I met who's a very famous abductee and author who has amazing experiences and the, the feds, they're all looking into him. Like he's got senators and CIA and you know, all these people studying him. And yeah, I just recently learned about him and I, I, he's amazing. I, I want to read his book so bad. He is someone that I feel like I really need to talk to at some point. You do. He's incredible and he's very generous and his energy is so fantastic. When I met him in person, at alien con here last year in February, I think or March, um, I couldn't stay away from it. Like, like he was at his table selling books and I had read the book. So he signed my book and then, you know, we kept talking and I just couldn't get Like I, I would go and hear some lecture and then I would come right back to his table. I just wanted to be around him. His energy was so good. And then he needed a ride to the airport. I said, oh, I will take you to the airport tomorrow. Gladly. Please let me take you to the airport because then I can have you all to myself for a little bit, you know. And so I took him to the airport and it was so great because I got to talk to him even more with no interruptions from everybody else. You know, yeah. it was so wonderful. And um, he came on my husband's podcast and um, and then Jeff went on his son's podcast. My husband, you know, Jeff, the astrologer, Jeff Harmon. So. I just love Chris's story. I loved watching him on Beyond Skinwalker Ranch, and he was on, I think, Jesse Kelly. I mean, Jesse um, Jesse Waters. He does a lot of media, and they're they're making a movie of his book, his book UFO of God. So I highly recommend that book. It's amazing, and he sees this as a good thing. Yes, he had some scary um, events with the UFOs and the aliens, but he sees it overall as that they're here to help us. And that things are going to get really crazy and bad before they get good, by the way. But like we're in this time of transition and it's going to get wild. So I would just recommend everybody get somewhat informed about this phenomenon and also do things to be prepared here, you know, in the regular world for mayhem. I hate to say it, but, you know, like God, guns and groceries. Seriously. Being out in the public and everything with your experiences and your interest, have you had any flack in your professional career as an actress? I have not. But then you don't know as an actress why you don't get jobs. You know, basically being an actor is is going on job interviews two or three times a week, if you're lucky, you know, or more. Um, and so you never know. You hardly ever hear back from casting directors when you don't get the role. Um you just don't get the role. And so it's not a very friendly <laughs> you know, profession in that way. Uh, sometimes you hear back even when you don't get it and they thank you and all that. But um, so I never know like if being outspoken was a factor. I know that 
um, I'm not famous, right? I do small roles. I've been in an Oscar winning film. I've been on Shameless. I've had some good luck. I've had some, you know, fun roles, but I'm not super famous or anything. Um, so I don't, I don't feel the pressure. I do have a manager and an agent. And I told them, I said, look, I'm going to go back and talk publicly about UFOs again. You know, I kind of dropped out for a while, but I'm doing it again because everything's really getting exciting in that department. And I want to be a part of it. And they said, you know, that's fine. At this point, the whole industry is so crazy. The industry is having a lot of problems with AI and financial restructuring. Like all these executives are being fired and all these streaming platforms have been overextended and they're not making the return on investment. They thought like the whole Hollywood system is restructuring itself and having its own drama. So, you know, I, I just, I don't have all my eggs in one basket with Hollywood at all. I mean, my husband makes a great living. He pays most of the bills and yeah, when I get things, I'm really happy and you know, but it's not like I'm not making a living acting, you know, I've gotten lucky here and there, but it's not, you know, a lucrative career for me. I was just curious because there's still just such a huge stigma about Bigfoot and Bigfoot witnesses. And I know with the government taking an interest in disclosure, you know, happening on some scale, I was just curious if it's, uh, if the UFO thing is more acceptable uh, at this point in time than it used to be. You know, I think it's all acceptable. And I think people like Goldie Hawn have come out and said she saw an alien. And then her, her boyfriend, uh, Kurt Russell, he actually was flying a private plane into Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix and saw the Phoenix lights. And he talks publicly about that. You've got Fran Drescher, the head of SAG. She said she was abducted by aliens. So there are celebrities, Demi Lovato. There are celebrities who talk publicly about it. So I don't think it's a deal breaker, especially when, you know, in my case, I have a good reputation for showing up. I've never been a drug addict. I've never been arrested. I've never done anything, you know, that makes me a, a liability mm -hmm. for a job. You know what I mean? I'm very professional. So um, I, I just... I just trust when the aliens, whatever they were, those light beings, when they said, look, we want you to act, you're going to be useful in that way. I was like, okay. So um, I just keep plugging along here and I have some really exciting upcoming projects. So we'll see if they can get their, you know, financing and all together. Um, it's just been a rough ride. You know, we had the, the mandates with the whole COVID thing that kind of made me, uh, you know, have a glitch in my career. Um, we've had, you know, the lockdowns and the strikes and this and that. So it's just been, it's just been pretty wild lately, but I'm plugging along, you know, working. I, I worked four days on a project just the other day and it was really fun. And, um, so people can keep up with my acting career on my website, camillejamesharman.com, or they can go to my Twitter or my Instagram and, uh, I announce things like that. So, you know, I'm just... I'm just like everybody else. I'm just here on on the planet in 2024, <laughs> wondering what the heck's going on. You know, are we living in a simulation? Are we living in a giant psyop? Like, what is happening here right now? It's just nuts. So, I and being married to an astrologer, let me tell you, it's going to get nuttier. So that's why I say, you know, I try to stay positive, but I'm also kind of in prepper mode. One more thing before we go. Tell me about the Hollywood Disclosure Alliance. Oh, yeah, that's a really fun development. So in November, I met Dan Harari uh, through MUFON here in L.A. because we started up MUFON meetings again, and that's how we met. And he said, hey, he's a publicist in Beverly Hills. He said, and he's an experiencer. So he said, look, I want to start this group, Hollywood Disclosure Alliance, and I want you to be a founding member. And I said, oh, yes, thank you, please, yes. So he got that going, and he and Steve Bassett put that together. And uh, actually, he, he told me that earlier. We opened it. We launched it in November. And we had our first meeting at Musso and Frank, this famous Hollywood restaurant. And there are all these amazing people in it. Shirley MacLaine's even in it. And so it brings together Hollywood people and UFO people to network and make projects about UFOs and also push for disclosure as, as kind of a, you know, an activist organization. So we sponsored the uh, recent 
press conference here in West Hollywood at a big hotel on the Sunset Strip for the Peruvian mummies that called the tridactyl beings that I was telling you about. And Jaime Masan came in, you know, from Mexico. And um, we we are co-sponsoring Contact in the Desert, which is happening at the end of May out in Indian Wells, California, which is a blast. I was there last year. And it's a really fantastic conference with all the big names and lots of fun over four days. And the, the resort is spectacular and gorgeous and warm. And you can swim in the fancy pool with the bar and the whole thing. It's, it's just like if you're going to go to a UFO conference, that's one to go to because it's a it's like a vacation at a resort slash UFO conference. Lots of exciting stuff in the UFO world for sure. Uh, hopefully someday the Bigfoot world will catch up. You know, I've, I met Kawani Lapsaritis and John Dover, who are both Bigfoot experts. And um, there is a lot about the phenomenon, as you know, I'm sure, that involves the paranormal. And um, I, I think there's something to that about them. And there may be a reason that Chewbacca is in Star Wars. <laughs> there might be. There's a lot of there's a lot of overlaps between all of the unexplained categories, it seems. Exactly. I'm in a new group that's ghost and UFOs combo. And I will be speaking along with my husband at an event. If you're in Southern California, it's in Santa Paula on June twenty second. It's the um, summer solstice weekend. In Santa Paula, there's this famous haunted hotel called the Glen Tavern Inn. And we're doing an event there with a group that is uh, a crossover group of UFO people and ghost hunters because there is so much crossover and I will be speaking about UFOs and um, also the time I spent the night at a haunted house in Louisiana, the Myrtles plantation. And Jeff will be speaking about ghosts and UFOs. He's seen both and about how he works with people to clear property and people of unwanted energies. So That'll be fun. If anybody wants to know more about that, they can shoot me an email. Um, and I have I have the flyers and info on that. For sure. Camille James Harmon, thank you again for joining me. I have really enjoyed listening to your story. And I look forward to talking to you in the future about some things. Certainly. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I and I invite you to go down this rabbit hole. You'll love it. And uh, But it is addictive, just to be warned. And if you've had your own experience with aliens, Bigfoot, ghosts, or anything else unexplained, send me an email at BigfootCrossroads at gmail.com. Check out the website, BigfootCrossroads.com. You can find links to past episodes, merchandise, everything you need, all in one place. And until next time, remember, there's something in the woods and also the skies.